This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Definition of a contract. Definition of a contract. Remind me. It's an agreement supported by consideration made with intention. Okay. And there was no consideration from Mrs. Carlin. If I offer to sell my car for £400 and you agree, you will give me something of value, £400, I will give you something of value, the car. doesn't have to be equal value. It does not have to be equal value. I will sell, I will sell my car to Benita if she will let me have this green highlight pen. We're in a contract. She can claim my car and I now have her pen. This is a value. My car is a value. The court is not going to look at relative equality. If she gives me something of value in exchange for me giving her something of value, we have an agreement. So there's no concept of equality of value. And Mrs. Carlyle had given nothing. There's a principle within English law that says if you do something which is for your own health, you do it because you want to improve your own health, uh, then that's not of any value to support an, a contract. We have here the situation, Madara and Yana here, these are both heavy smokers. They, they're desperate for a cigarette. But Madara wants to give up. And Yana certainly doesn't want to give up. So what I shall do is I shall offer you both a hundred pounds if you will not smoke another cigarette by the end of Friday. And they do. They both manage to last out until the end of Friday. They both come to me and say, can we have our hundred pounds? I say, no. No, you can't have it. I'm not going to pay you. What have you done? You've not done anything. I have had no benefit. You've not, you've not given me anything in exchange for my hundred pounds. So I'll ask you the question. Can Madara or Yana, or both, or neither, claim the hundred pounds. Mara. And if yes, which one or both? Go on, Yana. Oh, well, you accepted my offer as well. You did, you stopped smoking until Friday. You'd say both? You would say Madra, you would say both? Neither. Neither. You're all three wrong. <laughs> the, one who can, the one who can enforce the contract is Yana. Madra wants to give up. So all she's doing is something that she wants to do anyway. And that's not sufficient to merit the title value. It's not consideration. She can't claim that by doing something she wanted to do, she has given me something of value. But Yana, desperate, climbing the walls for a cigarette. She got three in her mouth when she says, I want my hundred pounds. All lit and smoke coming out of her. She's desperate for a cigarette and has been for the last three days. She has given up her own personal comfort in accepting my offer. She has given up her own wished for way of life. So she has given something in exchange and she can claim the hundred pounds. Madra did it because she wanted to, it was just an incentive and therefore she can't claim the hundred pounds. The decision, the decision is you can claim the hundred pounds because you have given up your personal comfort Whereas Madra has also given up personal comfort, but she wanted to. You gave up personal comfort, but you didn't want to. Mrs. Carlyle took these smoke balls to help her singing voice and stop her snoring. She said, I bought these smoke balls, smoke balls and I've, I've, I've been taking them in order to stop me snoring and stop me catching influenza. And the carbolic smoke ball company said, self-seeking acts, which is what Madra did, Self-seeking acts are not sufficient to merit the title consideration. 
Mrs. Carlyle has not given anything. She wanted to take the medicine in order to stop herself from snoring, in order to stop herself from catching influenza. And Mrs. Carlyle was literally quite obviously upset. Let's go through these defences and see where these defences get us to. Because they're all five potentially valid defences. And until this case, an offer to the world at large was not allowed. But imagine losing your dog. And it's a favourite dog. It's a dog that's been with you for many years since you were little girls and little boys. And, and your dog has run away and you want your dog back and you offer and you put an advert in the local paper that says, reward offered, $50 for the return of my whatever type of dog. Uh, and you put a picture in there and you're advertising and an advert is an invitation. But if it's an advert for a reward, then anyone anywhere in the world can read that advert and can, can come along to your city and start looking for your dog and hopefully find it and return it to you. It's an offer to the world at large. Anyone, anywhere can accept that offer. So it is available to make an offer to the world at large in the context, typically, of a reward being offered. Was Mrs. Carlyle's? Yeah. The reward was if you do catch influenza, you get rewarded by £100. So it is an offer. It's not an invitation. There was no intention, said the com smoke wall company, no intention to create legal relations. This was just advertising talk. We never intended that we should actually have to pay out £100. And the court said, did you actually transfer a thousand pounds to a separate bank account? Yes. Why? If you thought there was never any chance that you were going to have to pay out, why did you put the thousand pounds in a separate bank account? Well, there was intention. They had anticipated having to pay. They did intend to pay. The offer too vague about the time period. If Mrs. Carlyle had caught influenza 10 years after this smoke ball treatment, yes, you can see that it's not a reasonable time, but she didn't. She caught influenza virtually at the end of taking the course of treatment. And even if she caught it three weeks later, it would probably have been within a reasonable time. What do you understand by reasonable time? What legally do you understand by the expression a reasonable time? Vita? It's a time which is reasonable, absolutely. It's a time which is reasonable in the circumstances. And the court will look and say, is that a reasonable time? If we are the directors, the entire board membership, or even shareholders of a company, or partners of a partnership, and I want to call a partnership meeting, or a shareholder meeting, then I shall give you reasonable notice. I have to give you a reasonable notice, or you have to be given a reasonable time period of notice. But we're the entire membership of the, the company. Uh, so what's a reasonable time? Five minutes, go down, get a coffee, go to the bathroom, come back. Right, we're ready. Five minutes would be enough. And if there were just two of us directors and I want to have a director's meeting, I can say, let's have a director's meeting. Now, that's a reasonable notice. If you've got thousands of shareholders, you have to give them reasonable notification, which is normally three weeks to call an annual general meeting and your shareholders will get together and discuss things. Reasonable time? Three weeks. If I, a person responds to an invitation, a company is inviting the public to buy that company's shares, to apply for and buy the company's shares. If they apply, they are making an offer to the company. The company is then accepting. The company acceptance must be within a reasonable time. And it was established in a legal case that five months is not a reasonable time. If you're going to accept a contract, you must do so rather quicker than in five months. So reasonable time varies. Depends on circumstances. A reasonable time is a time which is reasonable. She caught her influenza within a reasonable time. She caught it right at the end of the course of treatment. If it had been three weeks, three months... Six months, the court's going to think, is that a reasonable time? And the court's going to make a decision. 
but within days of the end of the treatment, that certainly is a reasonable time. So even though it was vague, the court threw out that defence. No communication of acceptance. We're back again to these reward cases. If I offer a car, uh, then you've got to tell me you want to accept my offer. But if I'm offering a reward for you doing something, you don't have to tell me that you're about to set off and come and look for my dog. You just come and look for my dog. And, and there's no need for you then to write to me and say, I'm about to go into the parks looking for your dog. You just do it. So in a reward situation, the offeror, in a reward situation, the offeror says, don't bother writing to me. And they wave, or they, the offeror waves the right of communication. To wave, not to wave a hand or a wave on the sea. It's a different wave. It's got an eye in it. And to, to wave is to give up something that you are entitled to. And in a reward offer, the offeror waves the right of communication. So they say, don't bother writing to me, just do it. And finally, no consideration from Mrs. Carlyle. Was there consideration? She bought the smoke balls. Yeah? Yeah. But when she went to the chemist to buy the smoke balls, she paid money, and the chemist gave her the smoke balls, contract finished. No, that, that's contract is done. So the money that she paid for the smoke balls, in return, she got something of value. The smoke balls. So what about what has she done to earn this hundred pound reward? What has she done there? And the court looked at her and, and said, well, it looks like you're going to lose. And she said, do you mean I've gone through all that personal agony for, for four weeks, and the court said, whoa, 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 whoa. what personal agony? She said, have you never taken a smoke ball? They are awful things. They stink, they smell, they, it gets in your hair, and it's awful, and I hated it, but I persisted with it, and I went all the way through the 20... And the court said, let's have some smoke balls in the court. The judge says, bring some smoke balls in. And the, the judge tried to take some of these smoke balls, and he said, my God, he said... Have you done that for 28 days? Have you pushed yourself to this personal distress for 28 days? You deserve your hundred pounds. And she won. That defense was thrown out. Even though she was doing it for her own health, it was agony. It was the Yana situation. It was the giving up smoking even though you don't want to. So it's a big, big case and it illustrates a number of points like offers can be made to the world at large and communication of acceptance should happen but may not. And offer terms, the terms within a contract shall be clear and, and not capable of misinterpretation. The, the offer period too vague. Intention to create legal relations. I'm glad none of you has actually said, yes, Mike, I'll pay you £400 for your car because I've made the offer now three times, and if any one of you had said, yes, I accept, uh, then I'm in a contract. Well, I would defend that and say, no, there was never any intention to create legal relations. It was just an illustration. But just in case the court disagrees, I now formally take that offer back. So my offer to sell my car for £400 is no longer available to be accepted. I've revoked that offer. Mail catalogues, bottom of page 17. Mail catalogues are invitations. Normally they'll say the offer is available for as long as stocks last. It's not an offer. It's not an offer, it's an invitation. A mail catalogue showing pictures of all these goods that you can order by post is inviting you to make an offer. Process of an auction sale constitutes the auctioner inviting a series of offers. I've got available a set of pass cards here which I'm prepared to sell. Do I hear do I hear two pounds? Thank you, two pounds. Three pounds? Three, four, five. Five fifty? Five fifty. Five fifty against you. He now decides he doesn't want it. So he says, No, I pull my offer back, I don't want it. I've invited these series of offers and you're giving me a string of acceptances. I sorry, you're giving me a string of offers. I've invited the series 
you're making this series of offers and it's up to me to bring my hammer down and say accepted. But until I accept, in theory, until I accept, the last offeror can pull his offer back. He can revoke his offer. 550, you want to, okay, it's back to you, 5. No, 4, 3, 2, and, and you can work, in theory. They can pull back their offer at any time before it is accepted. Doesn't happen in practice at an auction sale. That doesn't happen because the auction house's own rules will prevent that from happening. Although I did try. At an auction, I was the last bidder. Everyone happy? Everyone finished? All done bidding. £32. And I said, no, I've changed my mind. Well, there was a room full of people who... Who is this idiot who's made a bid and now wants to change them? And a sea of faces turn round to look at me. And a bless her, a woman at the front hadn't heard me. And she said to the auctioneer, 33 pounds. And so I was, I was fortunate, I escaped. But I tried to pull back an offer in an auction sale. And the, the auctioneer said that you can't do it. But the woman made a, another bid instead. Uh, so process, process of an auction sale and then an advert offering a reward is an offer, it's not an invitation we had a look at that, this £100 for Carlisle is effectively a reward for catching influenza but we've got a couple of cases we've actually got three cases and we've already dealt with Carlisle so we'll have a quick look at these others, Williams and Carwardine this is in your Christian name list and it's also in your cars list. Twice it should be in the cars list, shouldn't it? Should it not be in the car twice, cars list? Once for car, as in Carwardine, and the other one? Williams, yes, it's not a motor racing, a Formula One thing, Williams cars. And in your Christian name list, William. So it's all over your notes. It should be all over these, course, these case lists. Williams and Carwardine, man and his girlfriend, living together, although that's not relevant for the story, man and his girlfriend living together, and the boyfriend's brother is wanted by the police and has offered a reward for information which leads to his arrest. And the girl and her boyfriend had a rag, had a fight, and, and he threw her out and said, go out of my life, I don't want you. So she went and she's destitute, she has no money, nowhere to go. So she goes to the police station and said, I've got information which you can use to arrest my former boyfriend's brother. So she gave the information, he was arrested, and, and we can forget the rest of that side of the story. She goes home goes back to her boyfriend and she says, I'm very sorry I upset you and I'm really sorry that I cried when you hit me. Uh, and she said, I've also got a confession to make. I've just told the police about where they can find your brother. So he slapped her around again and threw her out again and now she really has got no money. She goes back to the police and says, I've come to claim the reward. And the police said, no, you're not entitled to it. The reason that you gave us information was not because of some respect for society. It was not because of you're trying to help the police carry out their duties. The reason you gave that information was because you were bitter and angry with your boyfriend. You're getting revenge. Revenge is a dish best served cold. And you're just simply you're sticking one up your boyfriend. You're not entitled to reward for, for that sort of bitter act. And it went to court. And the court established as a principle that the motivation behind your acts, which then entitled you, to, entitled you to a reward, the reason you did those acts is not relevant. Motivation is not an issue. What is important is that at the time you did those reward-earning acts, you were aware, you knew that the reward offer existed. As long as you knew that the reward existed, 
then you're entitled to claim it, no matter if you do it for the benefit of society or you do it for pure, cold-hearted revenge. It doesn't matter why you did it. If you knew it existed, you can claim it. Aaron Clark was about a member of a gang of, of villains, a member of a gang of uh, criminals, a member of the Ned Kelly gang. He was illiterate, Clark was illiterate. He, he couldn't himself read. But of an evening, the doc, the doctor in the gang, would read newspaper cuttings about what the gang had been doing and, and how the reward offered was going up and up and up. So he did know, because the doc, in reading these newspaper cuttings, had informed him that there was a reward. And Clark was captured by the police. And he was given the opportunity, the expression is to turn Queen's evidence, the, the, where you get a, a complete pardon if you give full information and help them catch the rest of the gang. So was, the, alternative, the alternative was they were going to hang him. So if you will give us full information, we'll let you go. If you don't give us full information, we'll hang you. What's the choice? I think you give full information. So he did. He gave full information and the police arrested the rest of the gang and then he said, oh, there's a reward. I remember there's a reward offered. I claim the reward for giving the evidence that led to giving the information which led to the arrest of the gang, the rest of the rest of the gang. And the court said, the police said, no, you can't have it. So he went to court. And there's a principle, isn't there, that motivation is irrelevant. Knowledge is important. Were you aware of the reward? And the court said, what? Out of... <laughs> what did the court say? Was he aware of the reward or was he not aware of the reward? He was aware. No, the court said he wasn't. The court said he wasn't. The court said that the only thing in this man's mind at the time of giving the information was saving himself from being hanged. That what can I do? What can I do to prevent myself being hanged? I got to think of some way of not being hanged. I'll give information. And at the time that he gave the information, the court determined, although how they do it, the court determined there was nothing else between his ears. Only self-protection was there between his ears. And therefore he couldn't claim the reward. He could, but he didn't get it. He didn't get the reward. Certainty in English law. Absolutely, isn't that? Certainty. Rigid rules which can be applied equally well in all circumstances except there are variations and there are exceptions and then there are exceptions to the exceptions and further variations to the exceptions to the variations of the exceptions. Brilliant. What a subject. It's fantastic. Love it. Get to enjoy it. Read it in the evenings. Read it to your friends or your loved ones. Read them. And translate it as you're doing it and say, listen to this, listen to this. Would you believe this? It's an amazing subject. Termination, page 18. How may an offer be terminated? Pass the exam question. How may an offer be terminated? Well, I've already mentioned the top line. It may be revoked at any time before acceptance. I revoked my offer of selling the car. You hadn't accepted. The offer was there on the table. It's available for acceptance. Nobody's accepting it, so I'm going to take it back off the table. I revoke my offer. It comes from Latin again, the, the Latin verb vocare, to call. And to re vocare is to recall my offer. I'm taking it away. It's no longer available to be accepted. Revocation, however, I've got to tell you, if I, let's do it again. I'll offer to sell you my car for £400. No, I won't. I won't. 
I've just said, no, I won't. Be quiet. No, I won't. I've changed my mind. But if you don't hear me revoke it, the offer is still there on the table. So revocation of an offer has to be communicated to those people to whom the offer was made. And if I offer in a newspaper advert for a reward, uh, then I must also advertise in the newspaper, the same newspaper, the fact that I'm now revoking that reward. Somebody comes along, or I find my dog, if I find my dog alive or dead, I don't want now somebody else to come and steal my dog or find it again and, and bring it and, and keep claiming a hundred pound reward. Find a dog, take it back, get your hundred pounds and then stand outside and wait for the dog to come outside again and keep taking it back. You can't do that. So revocation has to be communicated to the offeree. The postal rule does not apply. Uh, I shall need to explain the postal rule, although there is talk that the postal rule is now so old-fashioned that is it really applicable to include it within the F4 syllabus. But I will explain it. I'll explain it more when we get to the next element of agreement, the acceptance. Lapse of time. Lapse of time. An offer will, an offer will um, fail will terminate within a reasonable time. And you know what a reasonable time is. There's a case here, Ramsgate, Victoria Hotel and Montefiore. That's in your four names. I think there's a hotels list as well at the back, so it's in your hotels list as well. Ramsgate Victoria Hotel. This is a, the Victoria Hotel Company uh, was inviting people to make offers to buy shares in this new company. And the way that the invitation is made is by a prospectus. So they issued a prospectus. It's published in newspapers. You can read it and say, oh, look, there's an invitation here to buy shares in a new t hotel company. I think I'll apply to buy some shares. So you apply you are making the offer to the hotel. I want to buy 300 shares. Here's my payment enclosed. The hotel company didn't respond to Montefiore. Not in a reasonable time. They responded in November when Montefiore had applied in, in June. So it was five months that that offer was on the table. And then when they did reply, they said... We're accepting your offer. Congratulations, you've now been awarded some shares, but the hotel is in financial difficulties, so we need you to pay the rest of the money, and then we'll go into liquidation. And Montefiore said, you can't accept my offer after five months. I made an offer five months ago. I expected it to be accepted within a reasonable time, and five months is not reasonable. And the court agreed. So an offer will, will fail, it will die if it's not accepted within a reasonable time. Rejection brings about the end of an offer. Rejection. In case hide and wrench. Make me an offer. Yeah, yeah. Well, make me, make me the offer. Say the words. You'll sell me that pen for ten. No. Okay. That's the rejection. No. I make you an offer. You say no. You may even wave some fingers at me, or you may, you may just tell me to go away, or. But basically, no. And that's rejection. And Hyde and Wrench was about the sale of a farm. Uh, and the farm was offered for sale at a thousand, and the man to whom it was offered said, no. He actually said a little bit more than that, but I want to say it a little bit more later on. He said, no. Well, that's rejection. The offer is no longer there. If he changes his mind, and says, I've been thinking a bit more about it, actually, yes, I will accept. Too late. The offer's gone. There's the offer, sale of a farm. No, offer no longer exists. It's not a, it, it doesn't, there's nothing there. 
you can't accept nothing. That's hide and wrench. Death. We have to subdivide death between this one, death for personal services, and notification of death for non-personal services. I'm in a contract to, to come here and, and teach you F4. And I was going to say if, but it's more a question of when, isn't it? If I'm in a contract at the moment that I die, does the man running these courses, is he able to insist or if I offer, if I offer to teach an F4 course here and then I die, can he say, yes, I accept? Come on, get up, get up. Can he insist that I resurrect myself and teach F4 and then die again? So the death of the offeror brings about the end of the offer. It's not available to be accepted. It's gone. But if it's not personal services, I offer again, I'll use my car as an illustration, I offer to sell you my car for £400. Don't, don't give me an answer now. Don't give me an answer straight away. I'll give you my phone number and you can phone me this evening with your answer. So you go home and I go home and on my way home I'm in a car crash and I'm killed or the tram runs over me and you phone up. And you phone up to say you want to go ahead with the, the purchase. Yes, okay, I want £400. I want to pay the £400. Now, I'll give you two scenarios here. And I want you to think carefully. If on the phone call you say, hello, is Mike there? And the voice at the end says, no, no, <laughs> Mike's died. And you say, damn. He made me an offer today to sell me the car for £400. I was just ringing up to, to accept the offer. That's one scenario. The alternative scenario is um, the voice says, Hello. And you see or you hear that there are tears in the voice. And you say, uh, It's Julia from Mike's course. He made me an offer today to sell me a car for £400. I accept. <laughs> and then the voice says, He's dead. Either, neither, or both. Can you buy the car, Julia? In which one? In which Because the circumstances are quite radically different. In the circumstance where you are told of the death after you have accepted, and it's a contract for not for a personal service, you have a contract. If you hear a tearful voice at the end of the phone, just take a flyer and just say, your husband made me an offer today, I'm accepting, he owes me a thousand pounds. And then the voice says he's dead, you've got your contract, you get your thousand pounds. But if you're told of my death, before you say I accept, you have no contract. So, termination of offer, if it's not for personal services, the offer terminates when you are told of the death. Bradbury and Morgan is a case which illustrates it. I think it was the supply of goods. Yeah, it was. It was a supply of goods and the relative of the deceased continued to supply the goods or continued to demand the goods, I don't know which way. Uh, and the supplier was not notified of the death. And it was only upon notification that the contract finished. Until you're notified, you can't know. If there's no way of knowing that the other person has died, uh, then the contract will continue.